Today on Your Story with Melinda, this is going to be a great show because I'm going to be speaking with a young crisis counselor, Barry Shalafu from Loon Lake, Saskatchewan, who works with high-risk youth who are contemplating suicide, who've had really rough childhoods in the First Nations Reserve. And what I'm hoping in this interview is that Barry is going to shatter some preconceived ideas about what we think are the First Nations people and what's happening there. And I'm hoping that he's going to share some great takeaways, some hope stories. And I know that he survived his own attempted suicide. And so I'm interested to hear about that and how that changed the trajectory of his life. So be encouraged. I'm going to be encouraged by the show because with Barry, I think we're going to get some inside look at the First Nations people and the subarctic reserves. And we'll come away ready to pray and make a difference in Northern Canada. Okay, I love the last name. Thank you for being with me right here in the studio in Oakville, all the way from Loon Lake, Saskatchewan. Thanks for coming. Yes, well, it's an honor <laughs> and a privilege to be here. Yeah, it's, well, your story, I mean, I've gotten some background information about you, but I want to get right from the beginning your story. Because here you are, a young man, you're a crisis counselor in and around Loon Lake. You work with high-risk youth. And to me, you look like a youth. You seem so young. Um, and yet, I know that there is a backstory before we get to where you are today. So let's just dive right in because I think, you know, people look at you and go, wow, you know, you are what an amazing man and, you know, you've overcome things. And But I, I want us to hear really from the beginning your experience mm -hmm. and what happened and transpired and then where you are today. So let's just start with you from the beginning, where you grew up and your own family experience, where you were at. Well, if we want to be a little bit funny at the beginning, I guess I could say, well, in the beginning, there was Barry born. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> so, but this does go back uh, to when I was five years old. And it, it's, it's interesting because I can remember being five years old. I can remember being in kindergarten. I can remember quite a bit about that age. And it, has a, it plays a significant role in who I am today, obviously. Uh, there's a lot of things that went on. Um, now, I guess an average five-year-old would go to kindergarten, you know, mom and dad are there supportive, pick them up after school, they go home, they have their supper and they have a good night, you know. For me, it was a little different. Um, like I'm First Nation and uh, my mom's First Nation, my father's First Nation. However, before I was even five, my mother had, and my dad split up. So I went through different family dynamic changes and one of the things that I had to deal with was the fact that uh, there was a lot of drinking and alcohol in the home. So the alcoholism affected me quite a bit. So at age five, I already didn't like it when mom left because I knew what she was doing. And it was that alcohol that really made me feel like I wasn't as valuable as I, as I should be. Now, on the other side, there was the fact that I also knew who God was at the age of five. I started attending a summer camp called Camp Living Water, and we operate, in, well, they operate in uh, British Columbia and Alberta, and they have an establishment in Uganda, East Africa as well. Mm -hmm. So it's at this camp, every year that they would go to First Nations communities and they would gather up some children that want to go and attend camp, and it was free of charge. So when I heard my cousins were going, of course, I wanted to go and be all excited, you know, camp experience mm -hmm. and everybody's talking about it. Now, the problem was you have to be six years old, right? So here I am, a five-year-old boy. Well, I really want to go. My cousins are all talking about it. So I lied and told them I was six. I told them I was six and here I am, five years, age, five years of age. So as I'm going, I put all my clothes in a garbage bag, got on the bus and I went to camp for my first experience. And that's where I encountered God in a way that I never thought I ever would. Now, did your parents know, did your mom know you went? Well, my mom knew I wanted to go. Yeah. And um, she was a little hesitant a little bit. My grandmother too was, um, a little bit hesitant because I was mm -hmm. so young. However, I was like, I'm going. Yeah, and, and so you did. And I just went, you know, because <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was awesome. Yeah. It was a great experience. And cool thing about it is that's where I got my first Bible, and uh, it was a Gideon's Bible. 
Really? Yeah. So they're, they're not just in hotel rooms, but no. they're also in camps. <laughs> yeah, they're in camps. They're everywhere, all, all over the world. So here you are at camp. You encounter God. Uh, in that, what's your life like? Because, you know, you know, at five, understanding God, why was that so important in, mm-hmm. in relation to your own life experience? Your parents are split up. Your mom mm-hmm. is an alcoholic. Talk to me about that. Okay. Well, I guess what happened is this is laying the foundation because mm-hmm. there is a common misconception um, that when you accept God, that your life becomes perfect, <laughs> you know? And in fact, a lot of people think that just because you accept Jesus or just because you become a Christian means you have to be a perfect person, you have to live a perfect life, you know, you gotta walk around and have the, the queen walk and the king walk, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. you these perfect <laughs> yeah. model citizens, right? However, being a Christian does not take away the fact that you still go through your daily life struggles, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, Christ Jesus didn't promise it was going to be an easy road. Mm -hmm. So what I experienced at camp was only laying the foundation to help me get through what I was about to go through. Mm -hmm. And what I went through was continual, um, I guess, disappointment in in my family structure. Uh, My mother was involved in drugs and alcohol. My father was involved in drugs, and he was dealing drugs. There was uh, physical violence from my stepfather. And I went through this, and there was times on the weekends where I didn't want to go home. I didn't want to be home. I wouldn't invite friends over because there was a time when I did, and there was a fight that happened at home, and I was so embarrassed. I was so embarrassed that my friend got to experience and see that with his own eyes. So I knew from that moment on not to invite people over. If I was to go visit, that was fine, but nobody was to come to my home. And I know a lot of times we think, you know, that this is the worst kind of situation for some of these First Nations kids that they go through Mm -hmm. because it's all across Canada and different reserves where alcohol is prevalent in the communities. So because of what I went through, there was times where I felt like I wasn't loved, Mm -hmm. right? And I would experience all these things throughout the year. And I would go to Camp Living Water with all this baggage, all this weight, and in that five days at camp, I would be laying my garbage at the altar before God. And I thought, you know, like, God won't want this. But yeah. every time I went there, he took it. Every time I cried, whatever happened at camp, that's what it was all about for me. It had nothing to do with the games and activities. It had nothing to do with making friends. Mm-hmm. It had everything to do with giving Jesus all this baggage and weight that I was carrying from the year. So that's what I went through. However, at the age of nine was a very very pinnacle moment in my testimony, um, which I was not comfortable sharing for a long time. Mm-hmm. And this had to do with going through the same struggles. Being in school, I experienced racism, being First Nation, Aboriginal teen, mm-hmm. uh, preteen, I guess, child. So experiencing that racism in a way that I didn't understand was interesting because like, I didn't know what racism really was at the time. Mm-hmm. I didn't know why I was seclu- secluded. I didn't know why I was excluded, right? I, I didn't understand. So when the teachers would treat me different, I thought it had to do with me, that they just didn't like me. And then I'd go home and I was treated, you know, the way I was treated by my family. And it's not all my family members. I have good, you know, mm-hmm. I have great, wonderful people. But um, there was times where my family did treat me wrong. And I, I, I made mistakes as well myself. But I felt like I wasn't there. I felt like I was just a waste of space. Wow. And at the age of nine, I started thinking, you know, I'm hopeless. And that hopeless situation felt like I was buried alive. Like I was just sitting in a coffin underground, waiting for my oxygen to run out. There was no way out. And there's no one you could talk to. You feel there's no one, I mean, you, you, you knew of God, but you didn't have anybody you could talk to? Like no. any, no way? No, I had my grandmother. But she had so many grandchildren and great-grandchildren that she was occupied by time. And it wasn't by, uh, uh, it, was, it wasn't like she didn't love me. Yeah. She did. She loved me to the core. She was always there. She is my rock mm-hmm. in my faith. You know, she, you know, she's, it's like Jesus is my foundation, my rock, my, you know. Mm-hmm. But she's that next rock mm-hmm. that's standing right there beside me yeah. to encourage me. But at the time... When you experience depression, 
your brain shuts down. Mm -hmm. It prevents you from feeling like anything that could make you feel better. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it also gives you a sense of uh, not being able to do anything at all. It takes away your enjoyment. You start to feel like you don't enjoy the good things that you used to enjoy. So you don't really think properly. Your brain literally begins to shut down. So in that process, I started to forget about the good things of people. I started to forget about, you know, Jesus. I started to forget about all these things mm -hmm. and all I could hold on to was the pain that was there. So in that moment, I started making a plan and that plan was to end my life. And I know that's a hard topic to talk about, mm -hmm. but it's it's all across the world. Every yeah. 40 seconds, the World Health Organization reports somebody commits suicide somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. And Canada has a big, big statistic in that factor in Northern Canada as well. So here I was, one of those statistics. I took the gaming cords from my PlayStation. I wrapped them around my neck. Nobody was home. My mother was drinking. She wasn't coming back right away. And I figured, this is it. I'm done. So I, I did wrap it around my neck and I, I had passed out. Really? Yeah. In that moment, I didn't, I didn't think I was going to wake up. So... And what happened? Did somebody find you or? Nope, nobody found me. Um, the miracle happened actually, and that miracle is the cord broke. I hit the ground, I opened my eyes, gasped for air. I remember clenching my fists on the rug and trying to breathe, thinking I'm about to pass out again. And there was so much pressure in my head, like it was just an experience I don't think anybody should ever feel. Mm. Um, however, at that very moment also there was peace because in that moment out of that intense fear and struggle, I was reminded about Jesus. And I think, and I know, because my grandma prays for every child, every grandchild, every great-grandchild, every day. And if it takes her an hour to pray at mm. night, she will do it. You know, I, Barry, the faith and prayers of grandmas mm -hmm. and grandparents around the world, mm -hmm. I believe that there's something sweet and special with grandparents' prayers to God. Because there are many stories I've heard where the mm -hmm. prayers of grandparents have saved yes. grandkids. Like, it, they've literally saved their grandkids. And they are on their knees and faithful and this is just a shout out to grandparents yes first of all keep praying we love you but i really think that there's just something of incredible faith that they have definitely that, that uh, saved you now so you have hung yourself and you've fallen mm -hmm. i didn't feel the fall i didn't feel the break i only woke up after i hit the ground wow and mm -hmm. at that point you're so you're like i'm alive mm-hmm Yes, I'm alive. Um, I couldn't believe it. I didn't know what death felt like. I just remember, and there was no anything flashing before my eyes or anything mm -hmm. like that. It was just, I, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. But the moment I woke up, I was thankful that I survived. Mm -hmm. I was thankful because, like I said, that moment I felt the peace of God and I knew he had a plan. Mm -hmm. And accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior when I was five years old, yes, you know, um, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. But like I said, it doesn't take away the pain. Yeah. But at that moment, I was reminded that God was going to help me get through it, that he was going to bring me through the storm. He was going to guide me by his hand. And I was so thankful for Grandma's prayers because mm -hmm. I do think that it had everything to do with her prayers, that that cord had broken. Wow. So... So from that moment then, Barry, you know, you've experienced where it's really a miracle, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, what then transpires, you know, and sort of your trajectory of your life? What, what happens from, from then until you decide to become a crisis counselor to help young people like you mm -hmm. once were, right? So what happened in that time frame? Well, it was interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, my lifestyle began to change. I wasn't the average child anymore. I wanted to go to church. Okay. I would walk across the town if I needed to go. Uh, my grandmother, she was very busy a lot of times, so I, I attended a different church than she did, usually because her church started at uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I loved my afternoon, so I'd go in the morning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like we all do, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I wanted yeah. to go play on the yeah. weekends. <laughs> so um, I would go to church all the time as much as I could when people wanted to go to tent meetings or different yeah. gatherings for, I would, for God. 
I would go. Yeah. And um, it was interesting because uh, at the at right immediately after nine years of age when that happened, I started telling people about Jesus, and I led <laughs> my neighbor to the Lord. Wow. Yeah, my la- my neighbor to the Lord. I put a fan right there in her living room, and I said, "I'm going to preach the gospel to you." <laughs> at the end of that message, I put a blanket over, her and I said, "You know, this is the altar. Come and receive Jesus." And she did. And to this day, you know, she she accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior, and she's a supporter for me in in many ways. And I know wow. um, that uh, she loves the Lord with all her heart. Yeah. She's now a social worker, and I believe she just finished. If she's not all finished yet her master's degree in no social way. work so it's Amazing. a shout out to michelle yeah right there. okay way to go michelle <laughs> so you're young and you're like now on fire mm-hmm. um and realizing you know god is always there with you mm-hmm. and protected you and saved you you know in that way like literally physically uh so you go about so now are you in high school now or what's what's the movement here you're in high school and things have changed and you're going to church mm-hmm. is that right well, basically, going from uh, hosting kids' clubs in my mm-hmm. uh, grandmother's room, living room at age 11 to going out to these different youth conferences around with uh, Rising Up Christian Youth Committee and being a part of as many things as I could mm-hmm. while still going to school. Now, the interesting I- thing is, um, in 2008, I started to struggle a little bit again mm-hmm. uh, with some of the things I was dealing with. Yeah. However, my uncle from the States came down. My aunt had married uh, a gentleman down in California. He came up to Canada and he started taking me all over to these different engagements he was speaking. And he took me back with him to Fresno, California, a place called Friant. And we were there and he was telling me about Jesus. He was you know, disciplining me in, in ways of ministry and teaching me how to be, uh, you know, pretty much a, a modest young man in the faith. And from there, I came back to Canada a few months later, and I signed up for a Bible school, like a Bible, mm-hmm. a six-week Bible program in Fort Providence, Northwest Territories. So I was up there at the age of 14. And uh, at the same time, I came back, and high school was a little bit difficult with me at first. I had to redo grade 8. Mm-hmm. However, uh, Tara Lynn Cook, she's a wonderful woman too. She was a vice principal of a school and she helped me complete grade eight, nine, and nice. 10 in one year. Wow, yeah. excellent. So I was there. So here's the thing though, Barry, like you're, it's, you're very unique. I mean, in a situation where your family is not like a strong foundation now you have a you know aunt and uncle that are you know working with you you have a praying grandma but mm-hmm. that's not most people's experience mm-hmm. um and so you know it's 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 a really amazing unique story for you but for all the other people that were in the same situation mm-hmm. with you they all went to camp mm-hmm but they're not all doing what you're doing mm-hmm. uh they have praying grandmothers but they're not doing what you're doing uh, what would you say, because as a young man, what would you say was the difference between, say, some of your peers and you in in where you are now? Because, I, you know, I think there's something there that is important for us to learn. Definitely. Well, a lot of times people still want to experience things in life. They want to experience what it's like to go drink and go club and, mm-hmm. and have all that experience that the world has to offer. We, we look at the stories of the prodigal son, right? We see what he had a good family, a good foundation. Mm-hmm. He goes out, messes up and he comes back. A lot of people want to go that way. They they want to experience things for themselves. What I did is I took those experiences from other people, like my family, like my, my parents. Okay. And so I, you saw and you witnessed yes. what you didn't want. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. And I knew for a fact that the reason why I was starting to struggle again was because of my friends. So I knew I had to mm-hmm. let them okay. go. And it comes back to 2 Corinthians 6, 14, not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And it's, it's not, you know, to trash them. It's not to push them aside. It's not to hate them. It's not to despise them. It's just when you're around people, you become who they are. You start to do the things that they do. So I started hanging out with older Christians, and mm-hmm. that's what really changed my life right up to being 18 years old and, and doing these kinds of things for God, like youth conferences mm-hmm. and traveling for God. And it all has to do with who you're around and who's there to encourage you, who's your support. Now, what happens if you don't have that? How do you seek that out? Because, I mean, you're really you know again not all people your age and in mm-hmm. your situation have that kind of those people mm-hmm. uh, what would you say to young people that are listening that are like yeah i totally want that but i don't have you know people like you bury around mm-hmm. me to support me where do you where would they go you see the thing that people forget to go to is god yeah 
right? Mm -hmm. He's the one who yeah. will bring the right people, who will bring the right circumstances your way. A lot of times we want to do it our way. We want God to do it our we want God to do it our way, but it should be the other way around. Mm -hmm. You see, I saw God. I wanted what he wanted, and he's the one who showed me to let go of these people. He's the one who brought these other people to me. It was a fight, because a lot of times I was by myself for years. I was by myself for months, you know. I had to face a lot of things on my own, but God was the one who brought these people into my life, and a lot of times I had to fight for it. For it. Mm -hmm. So now you are, you know, you're 18, you're on fire for God. How do you become a crisis counselor? Because I want to talk a bit, you know, uh, in the last minutes of the show, about the crisis counselor and and the needs mm -hmm. um, of of what you're doing for at risk youth and and help our viewers understand how important the work that you're doing what we can do to support. So you then become how do, how does that work? You, you're from there and then you become a crisis counselor. Why? So I see what kids are going through. Mm -hmm. I started working all over with different organizations, helping them out, um, like Camp Living Water, which I'm one of the directors for now. Okay. And basically, I saw how my testimony started to really help and influence young people and how young people are really drawn to what I experienced from self-harm to suicide to survival to you know going out and, and being who I am today okay. so I made I, I wanted to do what I could do so I did go to college and I didn't really like it though because it was taking away my time yeah. and uh, but I, I did <laughs> but you did you pushed through Barry which is yeah. good yeah so that was a great experience okay. however uh, a lot of it had to do with being invited into these communities first off as, as a guest speaker okay. as a workshop facilitator so that's what I that's how I started out and then I started getting these contracts from communities they're like you know we want you here come on come on down come and talk to our youth come and look at our crisis prevention program come and look at this Tell so me they were looking think. at you to say you were able to kind of get through um, you know difficulties incredible mm -hmm. difficulties and then they saw you and said wow you know yeah. he, he he made it through so mm -hmm. we want him to come back and inspire our kids is that yes. essentially what happened okay yes so you're going into these communities yes and there's a, a lot of these communities are really struggling you yeah. know like this Makwasagig on First Nation where I was working. And where is that? This is right beside Loon Lake where, I'm, where I live. In Saskatchewan? Yes. Okay. And uh, they're going through all these crisis situations. I'm working at the school. I'm the school counseling department team lead. Mm -hmm. And all these kids are wanting to kill themselves and I'm, I'm fighting for their life and I'm talking to the government and I'm talking to Health Canada. And why are they wanting, like I know we hear it in the news, Bear, but why are they wanting to kill themselves and why are we hearing reports of like en masse? Like it's not just one but a mm -hmm. number. What What's going on? It's again hopelessness and, and and it's a false sense of uh, trying to seek someone that they're not. They want to be somebody special. They don't realize that they already are someone special. And that's what I, I look at. I say, you know, like, yes, you're going through the struggles. You're going through what I went through. You're going through worse situations or whatever whatever they go through. God can help them get through it, you know. And it's not just God, you know. It's, it's also the gifts that are given to them when they're born, you know, that God had given mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And so you look at these things, you tell them, you know that you can make it through. And yes, they do think about all the overwhelming problems mm -hmm. that they go through and in that, that false sense of uh, hopelessness. But you give them that hope, you give them a chance for someone to talk to, they will tell you everything they're going through. They will begin to speak with you and, and tell you as they begin to trust you. And that's mm -hmm. obviously the first step. So I guess, I, you know, and enlighten me and educate me. So you've got these young people in, in um, you know, the what would you call them, their communities. Mm -hmm. First, Nation First Nations reserves and communities. Yeah. Are they able to leave and get out and, and get schooling and then get a job in an urban city? Like what, help me understand that. So when you're giving them hope, is it staying within their community and working there and and finding a job and, and using their gifts? Or is there an encouragement to leave, be educated? And, you know, like so I'm trying to understand if you're giving a, a girl or, or a boy who's a, in grade 11, like mm -hmm. hope, what would that look like? What would you tell them? Well, basically, we would, there's different kind of therapy methods, right? There's therapy methods for depression, there's therapy yeah. methods for goals. And so you would use these different therapy methods along with the leading of the Holy Spirit. And you look at things like uh, wanting to leave as, as a goal, but not leaving to run away yes. but leaving to achieve something so that they can bring it back to the community okay. and showing them it's it's not impossible 
Mm-hmm. It, they feel like it is because they look at themselves as I can't afford this. I don't think this can happen to me, you know. Yeah. But they can, and I know they can because if I can and other kids across Canada can do it, yeah. then they can too. So you begin exactly. to share that with them, and mm-hmm. and they begin to get grasp it, and they begin to move on with that. So Barry, it sounds like it's a natural progression. So you're being asked to speak at these reserves and communities, and you're seeing the need. Mm-hmm. You know, you're seeing how young people are committing suicide. Mm-hmm. So obviously, that makes sense then for you then to you know go to college get education and become a crisis counselor yes and that's what you're doing now yes and I wow it's so encouraging to see you as such a young man Mm -hmm. in in you know that role Uh, as you experience this and work within crisis counseling you know is what are your thoughts about for Canada and I know these are values that are transferable around the world yes and especially with our First Nations people but as a Canadian who lives in southern, you know, Ontario, like sort of not in northern Canada, what would you say to us as far as understanding how to respond when we, when we hear these news mm-hmm. stories, uh, when we see the incredible needs of our First Nations people? How, how should we respond in, mm-hmm. in, in a spiritual way and also in a very practical way? Okay. Well, first of all, yes, spiritual way, um, yeah. pray. And when you say you're going to pray or when you type on Facebook, I'm praying, (laughs) it's not praying when you say I'm praying for you and then you walk away, right? Um, Also, another thing to to be said and mentioned here, um, and I mentioned to you, that, mentioned this to you earlier, was um, to remember what what does it mean when it's northern Canada, right? Mm-hmm. You think of the Inuit in the north, you think way up there in the permafrost, but you start to forget about the subarctic, you start to forget about northern northern BC, northern Alberta, northern Saskatchewan, right? You forget about these northern communities. And it's important to remember that just 300 kilometers away, that kids are still experiencing, you know, what you, what you, what these kids in the arctic are also experiencing Um, so to remind themselves to pray and it's okay to give to organizations who who are going out and and presenting uh, different adverse uh, um, i guess humanitarian efforts but not just that but also um, understanding that people are up there praying and working on the front lines like counselors, Christian ministries, pastors, pray for them, encourage mm-hmm. them. Don't be afraid to to lift them up in prayer, to find them on Facebook and give them a word of encouragement. Because yeah, in, good. Yeah, these communities are struggling. And um, and it's not just that. There's there's the communities that are also doing really well as well. Mm-hmm. But to remind yourself that it, it, it's not just around over the seas in Africa. It's in India. It's in northern Canada. Yeah, it's right in our own country. Exactly. Um, now, I know you also have a connection with the Gideons mm-hmm. uh, International in Canada. You, you received your Bible, your first Bible at five at the camp. Uh, what's the connection there? Because I know that's an important partnership with you mm-hmm. as well. So with uh, the Gideons International in Canada, um, we I look at, at them as as a tool Mm -hmm. of ministry support, as a partner in the communities I work in. So my connection with them is we we have a similar goal to bring the word of God into these northern communities. And mm-hmm. so we work together when we can. And I know uh, there's so many different Gideon's chapters all across Canada and God bless them for the work that they yeah. do because given that word of God is so powerful, that Bible well, I yeah, and look, Yeah, I was gonna say, look at you <laughs> with that. Uh, so we need to pray. Mm-hmm. We need to remember um, our fellow brothers and sisters and the work that they're doing. Yes. Subarctic, northern Canada. But for an average person listening, Barry, um, what would be a takeaway? You know, here's your story, thinking of your story, thinking about, you know, choices you made. What would be sort of a, a takeaway for somebody who's listening who has suicidal thoughts, who uh, is struggling with hopelessness, mm-hmm. is, is, is is sensing they're not seen or known very lonely. What would your encouragement be to them? My encouragement is not to give up, to realize that you can breathe. What you're going through today ain't going to be what you go through tomorrow. Yeah. To know that God is always there, even when we feel like he's the furthest person, he's always the closest one to the heartbeat. Mm -hmm. To know that there are people praying, there is that prayer line there at Crossroads Ministries. Right? Mm-hmm. It's one eight six six two seven three quadruple four. Wow. Mm-hmm. To call that number, 
right? Talk to somebody. Don't give up. Mm-hmm. Let people know what you're going through. A lot of times you, you feel like nobody's going to listen, but just don't stop telling until someone does. There's always somebody who will listen and always someone who will care. That's so beautiful, Barry. You know, your life is, is so inspiring for me. I think, you know, we talked in the kitchen mm-hmm. uh, right next door to the studio here. It was really great to talk about the choices because mm-hmm. so many young people like you and myself, you know, there is always sort of this like a choice here or a choice there, choice to the right, to the left. And uh, I'm really inspired by you that as you struggle through, like many young people do, you made the choice, though, uh, to do the right thing, to be around you know, the right people in, in that season. And then it's amazing how God takes you, which you probably never thought that you would <laughs> ever be a crisis counselor at your age, exactly. and takes you into amazing places to do his work. Mm-hmm. So thank you. Thank you for the good work. And we will be praying for you. Uh, you know, the concern of what's happening uh, with First Nations young people, mm-hmm. um, you know, is concerning. And so what we need to encourage and, and to our viewers and listeners, encourage you to pray and to support organizations that are there. So, Definitely. Barry, thank you so much um, for being here in the studio. Safe travels back to Loon Lake. Yes. And uh, thanks for being on Your Story with Melinda. Thank you. You're welcome. And God bless. Thanks. Hey, thanks for checking out this week's episode of Your Story with Melinda. There's plenty more at faithstrongtoday.com slash your story. But if you really want more, make sure you subscribe to the show so you never, ever miss an episode. Did I hit it?